Hey guys, so today you and I are going to talk about backend developers. So let's get into it. So the question in question was, uh, you might have expected this one. Frederick, how do I acquire the mindset of a seasoned backend developer? Yes, because we already touched on front and now didn't we? I think, at least, yeah, we did. So let's get into it. Um, well, uh, similar to, like, as I've said in the other video, like, uh, how to become a seasoned anything really comes down to experience over time. Uh, it's not something that you're gonna do in a, like, it, it's not something that just happens. It takes time. The main differences, I would say, between the front-end world and the back-end world when it comes to becoming seasoned has to do more with what what is high value to focus on, what, what usually is the thing that gives you the most amount of value and makes you the most efficient at your job. And so if front-end it's usually tooling, like there's a lot of tools related to the front-end space and so the diversity of things you need to know in order to make a website or like a front-end application is pretty big and you're going to spend a lot of time doing that. For backend, the scope is more narrow. It's not so focused on tooling in to the same extent because, I mean, there are tons of libraries that do all kinds of fancy stuff, but usually for the backend developers on the average backend code, the amount of libraries you're using is sure, there are absolutely arguments for how, you know, it, it, at least in my experience, there's not as many dependencies, which is, I think, a very good thing in av on average. The thing that usually makes the difference, though, is how well do you understand system design, like the more theoretical aspects, and above all else, data structure. Like, the, how do you, how well do you understand how to effectively or uh, um, store and uh, model data? This is the number one difference between a very efficient working backend system, in my opinion, at the very least, and a very ineffectively working um, uh, system. The way that I usually like to think about it is that when you have a, uh, you can almost think of it as a network of nodes. Uh, well, it's a basically a, a network of nodes. If we're talking microservices, where I'm not saying everybody's going to run microservices, but I'm saying that most of you are going to work in a SOA environment, where you usually have different systems within the network that hold some piece of information or some type of functionality. And the number one reason as to why this becomes complicated is when you orchestrate the responsibility of these services in the incorrect fashion, where you might have multiple data sources that are codependent for the functionality that you want to or do. You might have stateful services where you might actually have to execute things in a certain um, order, where you might have one system that handles one thing and another system that handles another thing and they always have to be in sync because of the way that this thing has been orchestrated. Slicing up the business domain in the backend systems in an efficient way to make programming as simple as possible, like to basically keep down this complexity is the, I will argue, the most difficult thing there is in backend. Uh, nothing even comes close to it, because the reality is that if you store your, like if you store the data in the instant data, for example, in just a simple, a simple thing as you split the domain logic of something that is codependent between two systems, that all immediately makes searching or anything that is like that crosses the border that needs to depend on both of those things more difficult it makes it more expensive because you're no longer in the same database. But at the same time, you, it's, not in fee, um, it's impossible for you to keep everything in the same database all the time. It, that's gonna, usually it becomes a bottleneck. Even if you were to go with that approach, they, you might have issues with performance, for example. So that's not like a cookie, uh, there's no clean way usually, and it requires a lot of skill and a lot of understanding of the domains in order to do this efficiently. And then you, of course, you have all these different tricks, like as I was talking about, if you're gonna do something synchronous, where you know that one thing, uh, you have th multiple systems that need to execute things, they're codependent somehow, so you might use use an event message or like a message bus or something like that. Uh, th there are ways so you I mean, you can do the horrible thing which is like synchronized uh, calls to each of, uh, each, uh, each of them, right? That works as well. But 
the, the, this is the area that requires, I argue, the most amount of thought. And you sort of have to, in my opinion at the very least, get to a point where you understand how efficient, uh, how to how to orchestrate these systems in such a way that the teams that are doing the work have an easy time and that comes not just down to you know knowing how to build a service it comes down to understanding the domain and understanding how to build a good API what functionality will the APIs need? Uh, how do you create standards between all these interfaces? Because as the system grows, you will have more and more inconsistencies between the different systems. So how do you make sure that these things sort of stay similar so that you can trust that you get the functionality from one API just as you would get it from another one? Because the the dependency problem becomes very qu very quickly becomes a big issue in the larger organizations, especially where you have teams who have some data, or like their system holds some information, and they don't have the functionality that you need in their API. Then they have to build it, or you have to sit there and wait, and you have nothing yet you can do about it. And that becomes increasingly more and more of a, like that's that number one blocker usually. Basically, that is so. As far as I, I will, I will go as far as to say the number one blocker for like teams in like distributed teams is that the APIs either don't have the data, or they have stored it in a weird way, which makes it impossible for you to consume it downstream. Like they form a, a classic one is, uh, you uh, like I had that for not that long ago. Uh, long ago, we were uh, working with uh, distances, and the system that they had was communicating they had decided to store distances in uh, in units of 100 meters but our use case was for meters or uh, i think it was centimeters or something like i can't remember now but like the format of the data was problematic because we could basically not derive what we needed from the thing that they were storing another one that i thought was hilarious was that one system uh, stored prices without the unit and so I asked them, like, but like, how does this happen? How can you store a like, because it basically is a number? It's ten what euros, dollars, ruples. Like, what is it? I don't know. And they said, well, you like, we have different environments, and we didn't have like the unit in some of the, those environments. But you just have to look at the market, which is a different field on the respond uh, on this other endpoint, and then you know which which thing that you're talking to. And I'm like, okay, so I, now I have to figure that out. How does that work in a country where they might have more than one currency? Yeah. Anywho, this these are actual real problems, and that comes down to architecture, and to not just like, system architecture. It comes down to data architecture as well, and truly understanding the business that you're dealing with. This is uh, getting good at this and understanding how to orchestrate all of this, and then how to set up efficient, as I said, communication between the different. Uh, services and the teams as well how they should basically design their apis and their functionality almost out of the like the get-go pretty much is a very important thing in order for you to become like a true senior uh, uh, back-end developer because most of what you do when you like when you are part of like when you're dealing with architecture like system architecture like this is related to this basically how do all these system talk to, so systems talk to each other who is responsible for what what impact does it have if we put this this data over here versus over here and if we get the input data in this format will that uh, satisfy our business need further downstream because if you're store as i said if you store it in the wrong format if you get the input data and store it in the wrong way you might not be able to do things further down uh, in a different part of the system simply because you choose uh, to do something that is not basically possible to fix at a later stage. So these are the things that you usually should focus on. So what I want you to take away from this is that if you want to have the mindset of a seasoned backend developer, it's very much down to system design and understanding how to structure uh, services and service communication and how to understand understanding how to 
basically run a fairly sophisticated distributed system with a network of different nodes talking to each other where do you store the data how do you model that system and who is responsible for what part of the business logic and that comes down to understanding the business logic itself this requires a fair bit of experience in order to do efficiently there are a few things that are always common I mean the business logic you're never gonna like you the more systems you work with and the more patterns you see the easier it will be for you to sort of derive what's gonna work what's not gonna work some stuff is common but most of it is like every the, the, the business domain is almost different almost every time for every new system you go to and that really comes down to your experiences in a very diverse ecosystem and that's why this takes a fair bit of time because you can't just work in one company and think you have this down you have to basically face a quite a range of different problems in order to see a pattern in like what is going to work for certain problems what's going to work for other problems uh, and then the, you you sort of start getting a, almost a sixth sense, I will argue, for how to structure things so that the services are decoupled enough that each te like the teams can own part of the problem, but they are also able to enable the other teams to do what they are uh, what they need to do because when everything is connected like this, it becomes a little bit like bumper cars. The everybody wants to go in their direction. And this sort of comes down to it's a that's a bit of community uh, uh, community building as well. Everybody's doing their own thing, and in many cases they work in complete isolation from each other. And there's a lot of tension that happens when people are inconsistent with the way they design their services. And there is like the number one complaint uh, here from the back end developers or like even front end developers in some cases is that they they can't get the data that like the API is shit or like something like that related to like so they it always almost always come becomes that we and them mind mentality where the team blames some other team for not responding, not helping out with debugging, not building in functionality in the API, etc, etc, which blocks another team. That's the bumper car problem. You're basically butting uh, heads against each other over and over and bumping into each other because you're all just responsible for one little piece of the entire problem. There are ways around this but structuring this in a well working fashion is the difference between good architecture and good data architecture and having a lot of issues within a company because what happens if you don't do this is that people start hacking things together and they start doing shortcuts and all of this stuff and that basically starts rotting the system because as I said they're just thinking about their piece of the system a seasoned software developer from a back-end developer knows that it's bigger than that because if w one of your upstream systems causes issues for you and you have to hack things together and you get that incentive because you have to ship on time now the next team is going to depend on you well hopefully you didn't just make a, lot, a bunch of very bad decisions that cause problems even further down this is the thing that rots most of the systems and you have no idea how often big companies basically can't ship basic things I and mean, it doesn't have to be a big company sometimes in most companies if you do this incorrectly you're basically going to put your yourself in a situation where you can you force the, the users to use the application under certain circumstances because your system cannot, system architecture cannot actually accommodate the business need any longer. Have a great day.